Hello and welcome to Better Man Clinics, the podcast where we talk to actual experts to address the questions that men want answered, but are either too embarrassed to ask or simply don't know who to ask. Before we get started, I do want to caution that the conversations in this podcast are for informational purposes only. They don't represent a medical consultation, nor do they present medical advice to individuals. Rather, we hope that the podcast empowers men with the knowledge and confidence to address these issues with their healthcare providers. As with any medical or wellness issues, you should always consult with your healthcare provider before beginning any type of treatment or preventative intervention. Now, with that being said, in this episode, we discuss aquablation, a new treatment for the urinary symptoms experienced by men due to an enlarged or obstructing prostate, known as BPH. In previous episodes, we've covered a variety of other BPH treatments, ranging from the historical gold standard, known as TERP, to minimally invasive surgical therapies, such as Resume, Urolift, and ITINT, to more specialized treatments, such as HOLUP and robotic simple prostatectomy. So how does aquablation fit into the spectrum of BPH treatments? How's the procedure performed? What are the risks and benefits? What's the recovery like? And of course, how effective is it? To help us answer these questions, we are joined by a true expert. Dr. Joel Hillelson is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Urology at the Grossman School of Medicine at New York University. Dr. Hillelson earned his medical degree from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and then completed his, med his residency training in urology at the Westchester Medical Center. He then went on to do a fellowship in sexual medicine and reconstructive urology at Mount Sinai Hospital. And now... Without further ado, I bring you our conversation with Dr. Joel Hillson about aquablation for the treatment of BPH. Hello, and welcome to Better Man Clinics. Today, we're going to be speaking about aquablation. Now, in previous episodes, we spoke about multiple minimally invasive therapies that are used to treat the urinary symptoms associated with an enlarged prostate, or BPH. We spoke about the Resume procedure, Urolift, ITIND, uh, amongst others. So how does aquablation fit in? How does it compare to the other minimally invasive or missed procedures? And for that matter, how does it compare to the gold standard or TERP? What are the risks and benefits? What are the side effects? And really, how well does it work and for how long? Fortunately, to help us answer these questions and many more, we're joined by a true expert. Dr. Joel Hillson, who is a board-certified urologist, assistant clinical professor of uh, urology at NYU, and an expert in aquablation. Dr. Hillson, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate the opportunity to share with all your viewers about this important new therapy for BPH. Thank you. We, we, and we definitely appreciate your insights. And uh, before we jump into aquablation, you know, Dr. Hilson, one of the things that I really enjoy doing is to uh, allow the guys that are watching to get a better understanding of who our guest is and kind of uh, what inspired you to be where you are. So maybe if you give us a, um, a little insight into what inspired you to become a urologist and to specifically focus on men's health issues. Oh. Well, that's a very good question. So my journey to urology began actually um, in ophthalmology clinic when I was a med student. I was mm -hmm. conducting a study on Flomax and interoperative floppy iris syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I went up to the urology clinic to recruit patients for the study. And the next thing I know, I said, you know, I really don't want to limit myself to the eyes. I really want to get a better sense of whole body and really, really get the good mix of medicine and surgery all put together. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was really drawn to urology from there. And then when I decided at the end of med school, when I was starting to apply, I looked into, I got a really great mentor, Dr. Gilbert in North Shore. And he introduced me to men's health, men's um, male infertility. And all of a sudden, kind of a whole new world in changing men's lives really opened up to me. Now, in my current practice, 
and outside residency and fellowship, I feel like I have the unique opportunity to be a quality of life physician. Hmm. I'm listen. I'm not. I'm not a cardiologist. I'm not saved for heart attacks. But what I'm doing is I want to make your everyday better. Whether it is giving you the ability to have an erection or avoid easier, or not have to plan your entire life around the bathroom. That's my goal. And I tell my patients when you're coming in, it's like taking a car for a mechanic. I'm gonna check your oil. I'm actually gonna kick around the tiles, tires, and I'm gonna make you run better. And that's really what I love about urology and what I love about what I do. It's making people's lives better. That's that's certainly a very rewarding thing to do for sure. And you can see the instant gratification of seeing them smile and and enjoy their lives more, which is obviously very fulfilling. Well, thank you very much for sharing that with us. I'm sure the guys appreciate that as well, to know that uh, somebody who really cares is, is on the other screen here telling us about this <laughs> cool. uh, important procedure. Now, jumping into aquablation, most guys have heard of a terp or a rotor rooter. We've talked many times about how the prostate's kind of like a donut, or some talked about an orange and how a terp kind of, you know, cores out the inner part and allows you to pee better. So how does aquablation work and how is it different than what men think of as the old rotor rooter or the terp procedure? It's interesting you see an orange. I was taught an apple, always taught differently by each of our attendings. You know, you got to go in there and just carve it out. Mm -hmm. Well, aqua ablation kind of, what's interesting is I tell my patient it takes a human error out of it. So when we, if you imagine you're carving out an apple and you go little by little, but you never know when you're reaching the outside core. Mm -hmm. By aqua ablation, by using an ultrasound, you're able to visualize where the end of the prostate is. So you're not kind of just digging in there blindly. So you know how far you have to go. And by programming the machine, which I like to call like a power washer. Mm. If you have this really powerful power washer, you don't want to stick your finger in front of one. It, it's really, really powerful. And it's guided by the ultrasound. So you know where the limits are. So, you're carving out the apple, but you know where the peel is. That's why I could tell Pam what the aqua ablation is. So that's why it can give longer results and better results than the turf long term. Got it. And so you said an ultrasound helps to to guide the process, but is there an actual human being doing the cutting, or is it kind of some people think of robotic procedures where there, there's robots involved? How, how much automation is involved in this procedure versus human intervention? It's a very good question. I mean, in the age of AI, chat, GPT, we're not going to, there's only a certain limit where we're going to let any kind of robotic surgery, quote unquote, let us do. I like to call it robotic assisted. And aquaplation is a similar sense. It's assisted. So we guide based on the ultrasound, and we're going to show a video a little bit later, uh, as time allows, of the aqua ablation procedure in which when we guide where it goes, we are constantly stepping on a pedal, and we have our buttons. We can say, you're going to go a little bit more and a little bit less. Mm -hmm. And always in the end, we go back in there and we clean it up because no one no surgeon is going to give up control, and that's not me. And uh, we go in there at the end, and we make sure everything looks perfect. We resect even a little bit extra that needs to be resected. And then until we're satisfied, then we're kind of done with the procedure. Got it. So, so I consider it a combination. So when you talk about the old rotor rooter, mm -hmm. well, it's, it's rotor rooter 2.0 because there is a rotor rooter part. There is the little cleaning up afterwards, but you're getting there in about 10 minutes as opposed to two hours. Got it. Got it. No, that, that sounds uh, certainly compelling. And I, I look forward to a little bit later on kind of diving into the details of that. Um, is, is aquablation considered one of the minimally invasive or missed procedures? Yes. In a certain sense it is because we're not opening you up. 
it's done through a natural orifice. It's done through your urethra. And I tell patients not to cringe when you hear that. Urethra <laughs> can hold a lot more than you think. <laughs> I mean, it is an opening and it can hold a very small camera, which is what we're putting in. And there's no surgical scars. There's no incisions. Everything is done really through your, the urethra and through the rectum. So in that sense, I think it's very, very fair to label it a minimally invasive treatment. However, what is not minimally invasive is that it has to be done in a hospital. Mm -hmm. And you have to stay overnight in the hospital because we need to monitor you after with this procedure. This is not a same day, go home the same day procedure. Mm -hmm. It's something that you need to be monitored afterwards to make sure that one, the prostate is a very, very vascular organ to make sure there's no bleeding and to make sure you can urinate on your own when we take the catheter out the next Got day. Got it. Got it. Um, now, in terms of, you know, surgeries are all about candidates, right? We talked about that for the other procedures as well. And some procedures had certain size limits of the prostate. Other procedures were actually better for larger prostates. Where does aquablation fit in? Is there an ideal candidate in terms of prostate size or otherwise for the procedure? That's a very good question. I was recently talking to my colleagues about this and how Many urologists offer one or two BPH procedures. Ironically, as me, I actually am more of an erectile dysfunction, penile prosthesis. I do voiding dysfunction as well. As I said, whole quality of life, men's health. I offer six different procedures mm. because every prostate, I think, can benefit and patients need to be able to be able to choose which one is best for them. Now, when it comes to aquablation, what's very exciting about it is that it becomes almost a size independent procedure. Even I had a patient who I did who had a 220 gram prostate. Now, when we did him, I was very surprised that we had to scope him a little bit about a couple of weeks later. And I looked inside and it was like if someone had taken a cave and dug a straight hole in the middle. It was a perfect circle where you could piece it. You're not going to get rid of a 220 gram prostate for, think of it, um, size of a softball. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to get rid of that in one setting. But what you can do is you can carve an area with the machine that's a perfect lane for you to pee through. Mm -hmm. And that is why it's very exciting because it becomes almost size independent. And I'm actually going to be doing something that's really exciting. We're going to be doing it. I, when it comes down to bigger prostates, men usually have a choice. Are you going to remove the prostate with a simple prostate, which is often a robotic procedure, skill mm -hmm. dependent, but that is not where I consider minimally invasive surgery. There's cutting involved. Right. In this patient, we're going to be doing a prostate artery embolization, meaning we're going to ask the intervention radiologist, cut off the blood flow to the prostate with your 330 gram prostate mm -hmm. and let it shrink for four to six weeks. Then we bring you in and we do the aqua ablation. Mm -hmm. So you have the benefits of both worlds. The prostate artery embolization is also considered experimental by AUA simply because it doesn't it will shrink the prostate, but it's important how you shrink it. Mm -hmm. To shrink some, it's not so important that the size becomes smaller. It's important that the lane that you're able to pee through and just right. making it smaller enough often won't help people pee. Right. Well, so far, it uh, one really compelling advantage does seem to be that size independence. Obviously, okay. for, for other procedures like uh, whether it be, you know, um, resume or or Eurolift, really they seem to put a line in the sand around 80 to 100 grams so this is kind of opens the the opens the opportunity to bigger prostates like hole up does like simple prostatectomy but i'm assuming smaller prostates are still fair game for the procedure as well right yes well i've pretty much made a cutoff 
in my mind, and others who are doing aqua ablation as well, we pretty much cut it off at 50, 55 cc mm -hmm. prostate. At that point, I tell my patients, if you want to do a procedure that opens it up, you're better off either doing a bipolar term, or if you're concerned about retrograde ejaculation, the idea that when you ejaculate, you don't see any semen, you're better off doing a green light. A larger prostate, when you do a green light, one, it takes longer and there's more irritative symptoms. But a smaller prostate you're doing a green light on, I find there's less irritative symptoms and it's done in an efficacious manner. So for those prostates, I do not believe an aqua ablation offers them a significant greater advantage. And there is an, an increased risk of bleeding with an aqua ablation versus something like a green light laser, a urolift, or a resume. And therefore, the risk-benefit ratio does not favor those prostates. In addition, there are certain shapes of the prostates that I don't feel, in my experience of doing almost 40 cases, I mean, we're working, we have about 10 more coming up, so 50, 60, we about have at the end of the month. Um, when you have a significant amount of apical tissue, meaning when you're kind of looking at the prostate, you're looking at it straight down a highway, right? And there's two road barriers. This is what we call the lateral lows, and they can kind of squeeze you in. And then there could be a nice little roadblock. Think of it as a speed bump. That could be your medium lobe and your bladder neck. The speed bump could, uh, could make it that the urolift is not a good candidate because you can't right. staple something to the ground. Mm -hmm. But if you have significant amount of apical tissue, meaning that the prostate just grows so high, it comes around, the aquablation doesn't reach that high. And that, when you carve out on the side, it can lead to the top tissue pushing down. Mm -hmm. Those prostates, I think, are not ideal. And if there's a very significant median lobe, what I do, I'll often go and do the rotor rooter first, because just if you think of a power washer, there has to be a surface that it has to give back tension on. Mm -hmm. If the median lobe, the prostate's going to the bottom, it's just kind of hanging there. There's no, nothing for the, the water will just kind of bounce off of it and it won't get a mount of significant tissue. So that tissue I tend to eliminate in the beginning. So therefore, the whole procedure would go smoother. Got it. So you can do a combination of like the typical terp or rotor rooter with aquablation to kind of get the best of both worlds potentially. Yes, we can. Um, we can. And I think it's important to note that no matter what with an aquablation, you are going to go in with kind of the rotor rooter to stop any sort of bleeding mm -hmm. and also to can make the perfect shape. But I would say that patients who are smaller prostates, I would not push them toward an aquaplation. Got it. Well, that's important to know. So again, we have for, for the guys out there, again, prostates smaller than about 50 grams, big median lobes. Those are things that are not great for aquablation. It's good to know. It's not all comers. And what I really loving about kind of this new evolution of prostate surgery is that really it is tailored. It's kind of uniquely tailored to every guy's needs. It's not a, before it used to be, you know, one size fits all, terp, 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 terp. And uh, now really it is tailored to, to the needs of every guy, which is really great. Now, aside from those specific, I, I guess, not really contraindications, but I guess indications away from, from aquablation, are there any absolute contraindications? Like for instance, if somebody's on a blood thinner or something like that, uh, where you wouldn't recommend aquablation to a patient? Yes. If anyone's on a blood thinner, then unfortunately they cannot stop. Not in a simple baby aspirin. We're okay with baby aspirin. I think we Years ago, maybe when I was just a med student, I knew when we were training, mm -hmm. maybe aspirin was considered to be an absolute contraindication. No, 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 no aspirin. I remember we used to cancel prostate biopsies for a patient was taking a baby aspirin. Right. Now we'll do everything on baby aspirin. So not a baby aspirin, that's okay. But mm -hmm. if you're taking Coumadin, Xarelto, and you can't stop it, that's too rich for anyone's blood. You don't want to, you do not want to go into this kind of procedure with a very, very vascular organ and not with the inability to stop it. So those patients, I'll tell them, 
let's do a combination. And that's where we really can get creative as urologists. And that's what the beautiful thing about, and I know we're here to talk about aqua ablation, but that's the beautiful thing about this, having so many different options. For mm-hmm. example, there was a patient recently that was on a blood thinner, couldn't get off. So what I did is I did a TERP. And I'm, I'm sorry, I did a resume on that 150 gram prostate telling him, I know it's not going to cure you, but it will devascularize the prostate. Mm-hmm. And once the prostate became smaller to the resume, because he couldn't get off of the blood thinner, where well, I went and did a green light. And a green light is much more, as the green light does it, it actually coagulates the vessels. So it's safer to do it on a blood thinner. But mm-hmm. doing a very, very large prostate, a green light prostate, 150 grams, you're going to be there for multiple hours in the operating room. And that has a large anesthesia risk as well for someone who's on a blood thinner. So you want to, so resume is a couple of minutes. You wait a little while and then until it shrinks down, you can do a green light. So you're able to combine the two procedures, which is a very nice thing you can do when you can kind of get creative with patients. Yeah, absolutely. It's an it's a nice kind of bespoke custom uh, solutions. Now, one question that we hear guys asking a lot, like from this type of surgery, any type of prostate surgery, if somebody's on medication for a prostate for BPH, Flomax, Alpha Zosin, whatever, what what have you, can they stop those medications after a procedure like this, or is this kind of working in in conjunction with the medications to help them pee better? In the aqua ablation, for that procedure, I usually ask my patients to continue with their alpha blockers for about a week after the procedure. Mm-hmm. The reason why is because although we are going to kind of carve out the prostate, there's a little piece of tissue we're leaving behind. The reason why we leave that tissue behind is there is by the end of the prostate, something called the ejaculatory duct. Mm -hmm. When we ejaculate, the semen come out. Now, if you don't want it going back into the bladder, what we call retrograde ejaculation, you try to keep some tissue behind it. Mm -hmm. So one thing that aqua ablation does, it it spares some of those tissue. And Mm -hmm. that tissue, if you can imagine, right after your surgery, is going to be very inflamed. So right. therefore, to aid your urination in the immediate post-op period, I'll tell you, take the medication, it will relax that, and also it will relax your pelvic muscles. You just had a catheter in. There is receptors in the bladder for what we call our alpha zosin Flomax, and they also can help with kind of the bladder irritation and bladder spasms, meaning the sense that you have to pee that can occur after you take a catheter out for the first week. So mm-hmm. there is numerous advantage of taking it and very little side effects of taking it for about a week. But long-term, I don't believe, uh, if you're still taking the alpha blocker, I don't think we're doing, we're doing this procedure so you don't have to. One less medication. You know, unfortunately, as we get older, the medications build up and then the side effects do. So if we can get you out of one medication, that's an improvement of your quality of life. No, for sure. And that, that's, I'm sure guys would love to hear that. They hate to be on the medicines. Now, you mentioned retrograde ejaculation a couple of times now. Um, we've talked about it in the past. Obviously, that's kind of when you ejaculate and nothing comes out. Uh, we talked about, we've had experts on Resume and um, and Eurolift fight it out about kind of, you know, this is the, this <laughs> is the lifestyle procedure. We're avoiding retrograde ejaculation, maintain your sexual function. I guess on that spectrum, uh, I think you alluded to the fact that um, and I, and who we spoke about Greenlight kind of said the same thing. There is a possibility of maintaining ejaculation after aqua ablation. Did I hear that correctly? Yes. Aqua ablation has a very low risk of retrograde ejaculation. In fact, there is a, on the robot or the screen that you see, there is actually a zone. It's called like a yellow zone. And you can say if a patient is concerned about retrograde ejaculation, you can take, leave more tissue. If they're less mm-hmm. concerned, you take more mm-hmm. tissue and therefore you're less likely to spare it. Retrograde ejaculation by 
itself is not a dangerous thing. Sure. It comes out. There is two acts, what we call orgasm. There's emission and ejaculation. Now, emission is where you usually get the pleasure from. Ejaculation is the act where the urethral muscle pushes it, the semen from the gland into outside the penis. But like everything in life will take the path of least resistance. And if there's no tissue behind it, it will often end up in the bladder and the urine. And that's something that we see in medications such as Flomax um, or Rapaflow. That's a side effect of those medications. So as said, aqua ablation has a much lower risk of retrograde. And to be honest, it's about one to 3% in my experience. But the good thing about an aqua ablation is that you are sparing the tissue and the prostate does grow. So I found a patient who had retrograde ejaculation and three months later, he did not anymore because that tissue grew back. Mm. So as long as that tissue is spared, it's able to grow back later. Got it. So th that sounds like another advantage for aquablation, certainly in the realm of the missed procedures above TERP, which again, pretty much guarantees you retrograde ejaculation. It seems like it's kind of on par with those other missed procedures that preserve it. Now, one thing I, I always kind of point out in these conversations about BPH procedures is some guys get confused about the risks and side effects of these procedures versus radical prostatectomy for prostate cancer. So I just want to be super clear out there. A couple of risks that come up I want you to address. One is, is there a risk of erectile dysfunction or impotence after aquablation? There is not from the procedure. Mm -hmm. But whenever you have changes in your body, there is a certain aspect of psychogenic ED that can happen. It's never happened in my experience, but it's happened with any BPH procedure, you know, that is your penis. And there can be some, and I think what happens, and we see it again and again, is that the anxiety of hearing about the radical prostate and patients perhaps reading about someone who lost their erection after a prostate procedure when you tend to get nervous about your erection, your body naturally releases epinephrine, the stress hormone. Now, not to get too technical, but your penis consists of two veins that get erect called the corpora. And outside there's a vein. When you are nervous about maintaining your erection, the epinephrine or the adrenaline will constrict those muscles and allow the vein on the outside to open up and the blood comes in and it can leak right out. So you can get an erection and lose it. Mm -hmm. So now you're getting erectile dysfunction, but it's not from the surgery. It's from the internet. Got it. And I really feel like this is why that's such an important question because it's scary when you read about the radical prostate and you read about your incontinence, your diapers. That's not really a risk with this procedure. This mm -hmm. procedure is to improve your quality of life. It's not for cancer. And what we really are trying to do is get out that tissue, not the cancer causing tissue, which is in the outside of the prostate, but the benign tissue that just grows and grows and grows and prevents you from urinating. Got it. And I think you mentioned incontinence or leakage of urine. Again, similarly, not a big risk of that after this procedure as well. Um, in the water two trial, I'm these are trials that they said they put it a 0% incident. I That's impressive. That, yeah, I know. <laughs> I, don't, I never believe anything with a zero after it. Right. I think I, I, there is no risk of stress incontinence. And I think mm -hmm. that's pretty clear because in a TERP, let's say in a TERP, the old rotor rooter, you can kind of the hand slips. That's not going to happen here. Mm -hmm. But there in, you have two, there's two issues, the storage and emptying. And if you have an overactive bladder, I mean, your bladder is just kind of always pushing, it's trying to go, but it's hitting a brick wall of your prostate and you take away the brick wall, 
it can take a couple of months for your blood to get used to the fact that there's nothing blocking anymore. So mm -hmm. there are some patients who feel like this urgency and they got to run to the bathroom because it wasn't a problem before because there was something blocking it. But now it's not there. The bladder has to relearn how to pee and relearn how to adjust to the new situation. So patients can sometimes get, in rare cases, urgent confidence, but the increased urgency until the bladder kind of relearns it's a new situation. Got it. Got it. Well, this sounds pretty, pretty uh, reasonable. And it sounds uh, maybe a guy out there saying, hey, you know what, this aquablation thing might be right for me. If I'm going to your office and getting a consultation as a, as a patient who might be interested in aquablation, what type of evaluation might, ex might I expect from you before moving on to the procedure? Or is there any evaluation that's required? Well, everybody's different. But in my personal way I evaluate every patient is I call it a three-step process. Number one, we assess your symptoms. I want to know how bothered are you by this? And I will tell you based on a, something called a Euroflow, where we see how fast the urine comes out and how much is left in your bladder, where you're at. There are some patients I say, you know what? And I had a conversation with a patient today. You know, I said, John, you're walking on a cliff. You're walking around, and unfortunately, when you're urinating, you're urinating 60 cc's at a time, and you have 350 left in your bladder. Yeah. Something will knock you off, and you're going to end up with, unfortunately, a nurse trying to jam a catheter in the emergency room. We've got to get on top of this. I know you feel fine, but you're not. Mm -hmm. But then there are patients who are truly, they would tell me, I don't want to live the rest of my life like this. Or I just simply don't want to take medication. It makes me feel dizzy. I don't feel good with it. And then we say, let's see what's best for you. I will do an ultrasound of your prostate and see what the shape is. And I think the most important test, although the most hated by many men, is <laughs> cystoscopy. Right. We try to play our ambient music and we try to make it as painless as possible. But, you know... My own father called me before cystoscopy and said, Joel, do I really need to do this? He's sticking it, he's sticking it where? And I'm like, it's through there. What? It's so small. I said, it gets bigger. He's like, what? I said, don't worry. It'll be fine. But it's a scary thing. But it's not as painful as you may think. You go in there and you take a look. And do you know why it's critical? Because sometimes you find something you didn't expect to find. God forbid you find a bladder tumor or more likely you find a little piece of scar tissue. And you know what? You can have a really small prostate, but it's really blocking. And you can have a really big prostate and it doesn't block as much. Size is predictive, but it doesn't always matter. It's the way it is and it's the way it's blocking the flow of urination that really makes a big difference and the changes you see in the bladder. Bladder stones, diverticulums, which is basically when the bladder is pushed so hard, it kind of outpouching of mucosa where urine can just sit. So we have no way to reverse bladder damage, but what we can do is make and that's an unfortunate reality of what we call BPH, which is the dangerous part, which is why I told that patient he's on the cliff. Mm -hmm. We have no way of making your bladder push harder. But if your bladder pushes a little bit, and think of like a water bottle. If you have a, if you have a small little hole in the top of the water bottle, you're going to have to push hard to get the water out. But if you take open the cap, you don't need to push as hard to get the urine out. Mm -hmm. So the best thing we can do to the bladder is kind of open it up. So when we do our camera study, I sit my patients down afterwards and I say, here are the two procedures, three procedures, or one procedure that I think is best for you. Here's the risk and benefits of all of them. My leaning is toward this, my leaning is toward that, but you need to go into their inform. Of course. And you know what? It's not the same for everyone. I don't know how it's like in South Florida, but in New York, they're, I'm their fifth opinion already. <laughs> so, I mean, 
we're ready to go and they're ready to go to the urologist down the street who's ready to do a Urolift on him and or I'm offering him a year. It's going to become everybody has their own biases, but I'm part of the generation in medical school of patient-centered care. And, and it can be a challenge, but education is very important to know kind of what you're getting into and to know which one is best for you. Because I have a patient who had a 90 gram prostate today who elected to do a resume, which was work for him. The reason why I elected to resume was because he said to me, I don't want to go in a hospital. I don't mind having a catheter at home, but I get very scared of bleeding. Mm -hmm. And the resume I understand is quicker and doesn't sometimes won't guarantee the result because, and I don't know if we were touching this later, but resume is a procedure when you put steam in the bladder, in the mm -hmm. prostate, it's like putting hot water in the prostate. Okay. So you put hot water in there. And when you put hot water in anything that it's cooler, it turns, the steam turns to water. That action kills the prostate cells. But for the first couple of weeks, your prostate's sitting there soaked with water. So it's very edematous. Mm -hmm. So your urination gets worse before it gets better. And also what can happen is that because we're not specifically cutting tissue or opening things up, you can kind of have an uneven distribution of what actually reset, re, resects. And it could mean sometimes you have to go in there and clean it up. But in terms of timing, it's in the office, it takes two minutes. You have to go in with a catheter, but there's no risk of bleeding. There's no risk of retrograde ejaculation. And overall, it's a very, 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 where I say minimally, minimally invasive procedure. And be honest with you, my probably my 10 year old can do it. It's very <laughs> simple. There's no technical skill involved. Right. But it's not for everyone. Right. But it is for some. And that's why all the options need to be put out there. So now you go ahead. Oh, sorry. You you had mentioned you were going to sit down and talk about risks and benefits. So I think that that's actually a great segue. Like pretend I'm your patient, right? And I decide, you know what? I really want to go for this aquablation. You think I'm a good candidate. Counsel me in terms of what, what do you usually tell patients in terms of risks and benefits of aquablation? So where I feel the number one risk of the aquablation is, is bleeding. And it's not a minimal risk. When they first started with the aqua ablation, they, did, they kind of assumed that the power washing thing would take care of everything. And they had about a 12% return to the operating room for bleeding. Mm -hmm. That was five years ago. Mm -hmm. So then they got together and about three years ago, they realized you got to go in there and you have to go with the rotor rooter and start, stop anything that's bleeding by the bladder neck, any little mm. blood vessels. And that's really changed the paradigm of how you kind of treat the aqua ablation because the aqua ablation is not actually coagulating. Coagulating, I mean, if you ever watch a movie and someone has a blood and someone has, um, and someone's bleeding and they take a hot metal rod and they stick it on it, that's mm -hmm. kind of what coagulating, bleeding stops with burning it. Mm -hmm. But the power washing won't actually do anything to stop bleeding. It just gets rid of tissue. So that's where we feel the number one is, risk is. And we have minimized that greatly by going in there with the rotor rooter, stopping anything that's bleeding, putting the catheter in, which is kind of like a band-aid that sits on top of it. And I actually give transexaminic acid, which is something that we use in trauma to prevent bleeding. And all those kind of add up to situation in which you have a catheter and afterwards and we monitor you closely. Mm -hmm. Now the risk still remains about 2% of patients needing to go back for bleeding. And mm -hmm. what does that mean? I mean, it sounds very scary. It happened um, once a couple of weeks ago to a patient of mine. He was there, we did it on Friday. Saturday morning, I went to see him in the hospital. And, you know, I said, this doesn't look right. So I took him back to the operating room. In 10 minutes, I found there's a little vessel there. We took the camera going through the penis. We put a fulgurated it. We put the catheter back in. 
and he went home that afternoon. It's mm-hmm. not bleeding like you're hemorrhaging out. It's just that if when we take the catheter out, I don't want you forming blood clots and peeing blood clots for the next two weeks. Sure. I want you to be comfortable. And so therefore, that's the biggest risk. The biggest risk, you take the catheter out and there's some little, something little like a, a bruise that opens up and there's, and you form clots for the next week. That's really where your biggest risk of the procedure is. And the other risks are infection, but that's pretty low risk. We give you antibiotics, but it is a minimally invasive procedure. And that's why I say the risks are by definition minimal. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's certainly reassuring. Now you, you've convinced me I'm ready for <laughs> surgery. Okay. Um, I, I hear you have a cool video to share to kind of give us an sure. understanding of what that might look like. Is that correct? Yes. I, let me get it up over here and let's share my screen. Um, can you do it here or do I have to? I think you can, if you go down, I think there's a share screen. Okay. So let's see. Yes, there it is. Okay, we'll share screen right here. Okay. There you go. Perfect. There we go. So let's get started here. So this is an animation of the procedure. Um, it's quite an impressive setup that you see over here. But to understand what you're looking at is that you're looking at yourself in where we call the lithotomy position. And mm-hmm. being inserted into your rectum while you're sleeping, don't worry, is an <laughs> ultrasound probe, okay? Mm-hmm. And into your penis while you're sleeping is that camera. And don't cringe. It's a lot smaller in real life. Okay. <laughs> Not everything looks bigger on TV. <laughs> and, and you see on the right side, that's your prostate as the camera's going back. And it's being hooked up in such a nice little setup. And here's the critical part. And I'm going to pause it right here. Here's your prostate. And I don't know if you can see my mouth, but yeah. here's the edges of the prostate. And this is the capsule. And you talk about, and you've talked about the prostate being like an apple. Well, here's your apple peel or an orange, and here's the center. So if you were going with the old rotor rotor, you would just take this and try to carve it out the middle. But mm-hmm. you never know when you're reaching the end. You know, if the tissue looks a little bit different, it's going to take a while to get there. And sometimes, you know, you're just trying to figure out where exactly you're at. Here, I clearly see where the end of the prostate is. So... What we do here is we map it out and we say, this is the end of the prostate in the middle. This is how far we should reset. And these wings should extend here, meaning the tissue should be resected up to these points. Mm. And once we've planned that all out, we adjust, as we said, these are the lower tissues over here. And if you can imagine, and we'll get the different points, I'll uh, go back here for a second here. So if you see in the middle, that would be considered to be the second of the week. Let's think of it as a highway. And now you can understand why this patient is blocked because there's no path for the urine to go through. This right. is this circular area that you, the urine has to go through. And that's where the prostate tissue is blocking. So you're kind of clearing it out. Now, this is a different view of the prostate. Now, this view of the prostate is different because on one end, that's where you're looking at the prostate as if you're looking top down. So I'm Mm -hmm. kind of looking at that area. This is more of the longitudinal view if you're looking from the where the beginning of the prostate is by the urethra and the end of the prostate here by the bladder. The critical point is when we talked about a prostate growing into a bladder, that is right over here. This is called the intravascular median lobe. As mm-hmm. I said, big medial lobes will tend to resect it for us. You see, there's a space here. Here's the bladder and the urine. There's a space there, and the water jet will kind of bounce off this. You want to just kind of clean that up sometimes. Mm-hmm. This is the bladder neck. This is the edge of, this is where the bladder begins, and the prostatic urethra is here, and the bladder begins right over here. So this is a critical point. You want to keep this intact because that can tend to be pretty vascular area. This is the mid-prostate. And we're going to get to, and you can see it a little better over here. This is the area where we're very close to the view of Montana, where the jackatory ducts come out. This is the area you kind of want to spare if you want to avoid retrograde ejaculation. 
So if you mm. map that out, and as you see here, this yellow, this is what we call the Vero steering zone. So we've mapped this out over here and we said, you know, this patient's really, really concerned about having the possibility of retrograde ejaculation. So I'll move that a little bit over. I'll spear a little bit more tissue. Well, I could say this patient's 85 years old and I'm fortunately, you know, that's just not part of his life anymore. He's okay with that. Then I'll just move it over. He just wants to have the maximum amount of, of great flow. So I'll move it over to the right. Now, as you see here, we're going to make some adjustments. We'll bring this up to cover tissue. Well, number two is the bladder neck. This is the median lobe. This is the mid prostate. And once we feel all these adjustments have been made, we move to the next step. And that's a bladder neck steering area. You see over there in the green, to spear it. I'm pressing on a pedal. My finger is on the negative button. Because if I don't like what I see on the ultrasound, I don't like what I see there, I'm telling that water jet to go upwards. And that water jet's going up and down and just getting rid of that tissue. And there, you never really see that view, but that's what it kind of looks like. You know, the tissue is mm -hmm. just getting completely ablated along the path that we're talking about. And it's getting sucked out. The tissue is getting sucked out. You know, when you look at a uh, turf, the old rooter rooter, when tissue comes out, it looks like shawarma. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's all gone. I mean, you go in there, it's gone. Mm -hmm. Really um, quite outstanding that it just kind of, it's quite powerful how much, the, how powerful this thing is. So as you see, that's the very spiraling zone. So it's sparing some of the tissue and it goes around and it does a lot less of tissue ablation by this area. So when you see the semen coming out of here, you'll hit against the tissue behind it and go outwards toward the end of the urethra where you want it to be. Then that's pretty awesome. The procedure's finished. Is it? No. This is what they're not showing you. Mm -hmm. I don't do this once. I go back. And I do this again with the machine because I want to make sure I get everything. So I do two passes. Mm -hmm. Then we come out and this is where the human part becomes in. The experience becomes in. We take an old rotor router and I make sure there's nothing left significantly to do here. And I make sure there's no bleeding. I clean everything up. The awesome thing about this is that you have a 200 gram prostate and that whole process there is five minutes. No way. Five minutes for a 200 gram prostate. It's incredible. Five minutes. It's remarkable. And you're doing it twice and then it's done. So you can typically do, if you did nothing else, you can do this in a 200 gram prostate in a half an hour. Something would take two and a half hours. At easily. least. Yeah, yeah, at least. And um, so the speed is, can make it amazing. But when you're looking at the outcomes, you still go back and make sure there's no bleeding, especially in the larger prostate to clean it up. And it, well, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm very impressed just in terms of like, you know, being an old school urologist and, you know, going in there with a rotor rooter and it's kind of like more art than science. And, you know, you're kind of putting up the thumb and saying, hey, is it done or it not? It was my favorite surgery and it still is sometimes. Yeah. Term. No, it's but this a, is this is a whole new ball game. This is very precise and the kind of, uh, if you will, uh, guided. Uh, it really, I think, it would give guys a lot of comfort knowing that that you know it's not kind of just in the eye of the beholder, but really, really precision oriented. Now, I'm assuming you said under anesthesia. I'm assuming this is general anesthesia is required for this procedure. Yes, general anesthesia is required. Got we it. don't want to be. We want to keep you completely still. We're very precise and we need your body to stay still as to be expected. Now, you mentioned that patients will stay overnight, which is not a big deal for one night. But I guess the good part, which doesn't always occur or usually rarely occurs with the other procedures, is that the catheter comes out the next day, you said, before they go home? Yes. We like to keep out the catheter the next day. Um, in 90% of my patients, that happens. Now, there are patients that we make the decision that I'll keep them an extra night just because I typically do these on Fridays and I don't want you on home on Sunday with a catheter and trying to worry about it. I want you to be, be able to be in my office. So I keep them for an extra night. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how it is in you. Um, and while you built this beautiful new pavilion that overlooks the East River with a 
each room has a big screen TV the size of my master bedroom. So <laughs> my agents don't really mind staying there. Sometimes I right. get, get out of the five-star hotel. You know, they have an iPad sitting there by the thing where they can order food. But <laughs> it's a nice, if you didn't have something sticking in your penis, you probably want to stay a lot longer. But yeah. I try to, I get it out. I want you to pee. And honestly, the biggest issue I've had is patients complain. The wife complains to me. She's like, Doc, what's going on? He can't pee straight anymore. It's just coming out so fast. It's going over the toilet seat. I said, <laughs> well, he's been sitting there with this big obstruction forever. And now it's a fire hose. It's not my fault. He has to <laughs> sit down for a week. He's got to sit down for a week and control it because it's good. You're not, he's like, he's not going to be driven with for 25 years and now just boom. So right. that, that can't happen. So you got to sit down when you pee, but it's quite normal and you can see some little blood clots here and there. Remember, and I tell my patients to remember, if you put a little bit of fruit punch in water, it's going to make the whole thing look red. Mm-hmm. Don't be scared by fruit punch. There's going to be a clot. One thing urine does is, you both know, is a procoagulant. It mm-hmm. stops bleeding. And it makes you form clots. But those right. clots can take a while to dissolve. So I would say typically, yes, men go home the next day and no heavy lifting for two weeks, no, no sex, no ejaculation for three weeks. Why? Mm-hmm. Well, because I care about you and I don't want you to wake up and ejaculate and find blood in your urine and then, and then get nervous because that impairs your healing. Half of the healing is knowing that you can reach me, which all my patients have my cell phone, and knowing that everything is going smoothly. You want to give that prostate a chance to heal over. The aqua ablation, when you go back afterwards, it kind of looks all fluffy. And that tissue is the end of where the aqua ablation is. That tissue eventually goes away and resolves, mm-hmm. but it takes a little while to absorb. So you do find that... Um, if you pee too much or you're ja- you pee very hard, you jack, or you might open up a little bit of a, ble- a little bit of a venous blood vessel that can cause a clot. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you want to take it easy. Typically, most of my patients return to work a week later. Mm-hmm. I had someone who decided to return to week that work Monday. Good for him. Mm-hmm. It's fine with him. It's your body. We can guide you. But you listen to your own body, see what you do. Let work know you're going to take off a week. If you take off less, we'll both be very happy. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, obviously, we talked about minimally invasive surgery, but it's still surgery. And once that, nobody likes a catheter, but that's only staying in for a day or two. Once that comes out, how much pain should people expect to experience after this procedure? Well, you know, when we talk about um, discomfort with urination. It's, it, it is kind of expectations that come in. Now, as a urologist, we can talk about how patients have, how they handle ureteral stents. Mm. You have a young patient who has a ureteral stent in, which is a stent you put in for a stone, and they're not used to going to the bathroom frequently, a little burning the tip of the penis. It is devastating. But if you take a man who's had a large prostate for many years and they have burning every once in a while, to him, this may be a day in, uh, you know, a breeze in the park. So it really comes with your expectations. You can really feel, and it's easy for me to say, because I don't have a catheter in, (laughs) but, and I promise you, I feel nothing. But, (laughs) you know, you're feeling something. So if you feel a little bit of burning in the tip of the penis, um, you can feel the sense like, When you go to the bathroom and you finish urinating and you just got to go again, but nothing's coming out or with the cast of the cost that comes out, this could be the bladder could be irritated. So you kind of, sometimes you get this like urge to go to the bathroom. It can be sometimes a little bit painful, but the most important thing is your body's healing, but you got to help it heal. And I tell a patient there's a partnership as any surgeon will tell you is you put pieces of tissues together You try to suture an inanimate object together, it won't do nothing. I try to Mm -hmm. suture my son's doll together, it's not going to (laughs) heal. He's like, why is it not fixed, you know? Because (laughs) it doesn't go together, there's no healing process. So drink plenty of fluids, avoid bladder irritants. 
Don't go and have your two coffees again the next morning. Don't have spicy foods. Don't have citrusy foods. Try, drink lots of water. Avoid constipation. Mm -hmm. Why are opioids a no-no after the surgery? Because they constipate you and they do very little to help. Mm -hmm. If anything, a Xanax will help with the, with the spasms. They used to have this great drug, BNO suppositories. You remember those? Yeah. Now they're not around. <laughs> but they were great. They uh, were. They were great. They were great. We used to give them right after the procedure. Mm -hmm. But NSAIDs, if you can take it, Toradol, I mean, the Advils are very helpful just to help with the bladder spasms and discomfort. So mm -hmm. if when you're going in, you never had anything before, it, it's a lot of discomfort. But it's not like a surgery where you have, you know, a incision. It's irritative voiding symptoms, which unfortunately was the reason why you had the surgery in the first place. Sure. So most patients tolerate it pretty well. Now, important question, obviously. Now, I know that aquablation hasn't been around for that long, so it's kind of hard to know long-term data. But from the data that you know, how durable was this procedure? Is this something that we've talked about other missed procedures where it's like, well, you know, it might work for a couple of years, a year or two, and you're doing great, and maybe we'll have to redo it or something like that. How does aquablation fit into that scheme in terms of durability? That's a very good question. And the aqua ablation team, you know, they were, they invested a lot of money in this technology. And the reason why we don't have the answers on those other procedures, because they weren't willing to take the step and do a very aggressive study. The aqua ablation team did. Mm. They said, let's compare it to a terp head to head. Not that it's, not that it's less, but compare it head to head, straight out, which one's going to do better. Mm -hmm. And they found three-year data showing that after a TERP, your flow of urination, how fast it comes out, is less than after the aqua ablation. Really? Which is why I would call it Roto-Rooter 2.0. Yeah. Because you're able to get more, and it appears, based on that three-year data, to be more durable than a terp. And logically, that makes sense. You're taking out more tissue. Yeah, I mean, well, that's a big difference from the other missed procedures. I don't think any of them would, would uh, dear, say that. Dear, dear, try that. And would right. dear, try that. I mean, it's hard. And yeah. um, with the urolith, it, you know, it can have a higher failure rate, but that's why we preservably do it for younger, sometimes younger patients, you know. But if you're looking for as you say, there's also the fact that if you're older, have more medical comorbidities, I'll tell you, do an aqua ablation as opposed to a more minimally invasive one, because you only have one shot at this before mm -hmm. surgery becomes more, the risk of surgery becomes more than any of the benefit you can have. Now, we talked about the how and the what and the why, and now we'll talk a little bit about the who. Um, I, I don't do aquablation. In your experience, do most urologists do it? Or as, as a newer procedure, is it kind of focused on a band of specialists? What, what is your take on the who of who does this procedure? Well, it's growing. It's growing slowly. But that was a matter of insurance coverage. Now, us in NYU, we purchased this machine. And this machine is not cheap. It's about a half a million dollars. Now, that's a significant capital investment for any hospital. Sure. Medicare started pretty much covering it about 10 months ago, 12 months ago. Oh. Um, and the most commercial insurances cover, started covering it about May, about April, May. You started getting the commercial insurances covering it. And now Medicaid started covering it about um, July, August. So that's when we kind of started building up and I started being able to offer it to my patients where there wasn't a huge copay and where the insurance coverage opened up. Now that insurance coverage opened up, I believe the biggest turning point is probably going to be the AUA where all serologists get together. We discuss our successes or where it's going to be and more and more urologists. There is probably an I. I mean, Bash is saying, is there, there's a procedure called HOLUP. Mm -hmm. HOLUP is a great procedure if you know how to do it. 
It's right. very technically damaged. It can handle any prostate. And there are urologists who will swear, hold up or nothing. You get retrograde, but hold up the greatest thing ever. Mm-hmm. Not, it's not for everyone. It's a lot of cases to get company. You don't want to be the first hundred cases. Right. I think it's actually about 200 cases. So you really, really get good at it. And you don't want to be those. And that procedure is what really limits men with larger prostates because they don't want to do a simple prostate. And I think that's where an aquablation, once urologists start kind of realizing that this is a possibility, be able to handle bigger prostate, it's going to become more and more mainstream. But I believe in the next three to four years, you're going to, I think aqua ablation is going to become the gold standard for larger prostates because the learning curve is not going to be as great. And there's going to be, have the ability to, um, we're going to have the ability to um, be, we're going to have the ability, I'm sorry, I'll be interrupted by a <laughs> crying child in the background. Um, but we're going to have the ability to treat these larger prostates and most and many urologists are going to be able to add that to armatarium because not many patients do robotic procedures. And if there's a robotic procedure and there's an ability to handle a larger prostate without robotically or without doing a simple prostate, I think many patients are going to easily become on board. So, you know, obviously guys in the New York area can certainly look you up and you, you're one of the experts in this. What if people living in other parts of the country, is there an easy way for them to find a urologist that does aquablation that you know of? Yeah, so the aquablation maintains an up-to-date provider list on their website that be able to show which urologists are being able to offer the procedure. Mm-hmm. Um, it's constantly being updated as more and more urologists become trained. I do think there's a little bit of a learning curve. So it's important to ask your urologist, you know, kind of how many have you done? And if they, but it is, it, it is also rep centers, meaning that you can control the machine, but there's also someone there helping you that's not scrubbed in that can really help you kind of guide the equipment on the outside. Mm-hmm. So important to know the urologist, are you going to have someone there who's more experienced, et cetera. Don't go into a blind, but at the same time, I think that the advantage of robotic assist is it takes some of the learning curve out of the out of the equation. Now you had mentioned for a hole up like two hundred cases. What's a what's a good number of cases that an aquablation surgeon should have under his or her belt? I think about fifteen twenty. You're pretty good. No, that's not bad. That's not bad. Not bad. Sure. I think fifteen twenty. You're pretty good, and I think. Because the biggest issue with the whole, with the aquaplation is knowing how much to do afterwards. The machine does the most of it. It's learning how to take care of the prostate afterwards. Now, as one of, now the most anyone has done is about Steve Kaplan in Mount Sinai. They only did his 200th case. Mm-hmm. So it was still in the infancy of someone doing it. And Chris Kelly, my partner in NYU, has done about 60 of them. Mm-hmm. So in these cases, we're constantly learning from each other. So it's kind of a refinement of getting the most optimal, how to do this quickly and efficaciously and with the least amount of risk. Now, it's not like you're going from having a disaster to having that. So this is really, really small minutia. Mm-hmm. But that small minutia is going to be passed on. And I feel right. the learning curve is going to be even less and less. So, for example, I decided to start doing maybe for, technically for the audience is that the fluffy tissue at the end, I feel responds better to monopolar than bipolar going old school. Because mm-hmm. then you can kind of yeah, get the tissue and below it, <laughs> you know, and uh, we've and I said about the median lobe. Steve Kaplan just came out with this. We were talking to him and he said, you know what, Joel, I was, I was, when we're doing our cases, I realized that I did better if I resected a little bit of the median low before. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where I, we kind of started doing this. And as the more and more cases come out, there's only so much technology can predict, but there's what we can learn from each other. And as we are a core group, I would say aqua ablation 
is becoming more and more common in New York. And we're kind of close to each other, you know, kind mm-hmm. of frenemy hospitals next to each other. And we all get together and we discuss these things. There's more refinement to the technique. By the time a year and two for now, I think that pretty much everyone's going to get it down pat in terms of a uniform protocol. Yeah, it definitely seems like a, a very encouraging and uh, uh, positive type of new procedure that can add a lot to to men with enlarged prostates and BPH. So when are you doing it? What's that? When are you doing it? Well, it's going to be teaching old dogs new tricks. We'll have, but you've inspired <laughs> me to 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 learn it. That's for sure. Uh, Dr. Hilson, thank you so much uh, for your insights. Really, really appreciate it. As I know the guys are, I can't tell you how many emails I've received from the gut, from our viewers asking about this particular uh, discussion because they're, they're hearing about it and they want to know more and more. Before I let you go, a question completely unrelated to aquablation, I think. Um, you know, the, the title of the topic, the name of our podcast is Better Man Clinics because we really want to try to help men achieve their best lives. You've obviously reached a level of success in your life uh what is the secret to your success wow i have to consider myself successful first and that's <laughs> i think the secret is that never being satisfied always achieving always looking for always realizing that i can do more going at the end of the day and saying how can going through the patients that i saw through the day constantly learning from my patients, learning how to get better in order to become, because my success is not, shouldn't be defined by me. I find it by my patient's outcomes because that's my goal. I mean, honestly, the key to happiness is making other people happy. And that's why I love what I do. And my goal is to learn more and more, to learn from my patients, get them the best outcomes. And that drives me to be successful, quote unquote successful. Because I define success by having my patients be successful. Very inspirational. And your your patients are lucky to have you, for sure. Dr. Hillison, thank you so much again for your time and for your insights. And to all the guys uh, watching and listening, uh, thank you for joining us again. And remember our mantra here at Better Man Clinics, your best journey, your life is a journey and not a destination. And use every day to get a little bit better. Take care, guys. Take care. Thank you.